So I wanted to take this opportunity to kind of think out loud and um, offer up some ways of thinking that I've been developing around Gouage Museum of Contemporary Art, which is where I'm working. Um, because it's, uh, in, in trying to understand how the institution is evolving and developing, it's starting to take forms that I don't, I don't fully understand or fully feel able to put um, a lot of the kind of terminology around the way that contemporary museums are like on top of it. It doesn't seem to make much sense. So I'm just kind of thinking through things in a slightly different way. And one of the um, terms that I've been thinking about for the last three or four years is this idea of um, a reflexive or reflexivity. So reflexive institution or institutional reflexivity. And it's a term that comes out of social theory. Um, Anthony Giddens and Ulrich Beck are two of the people who have kind of thought through reflexivity the most in relation to what they call um, reflexive um, modernization or reflexive modernity. And within that, they talk about kind of institutional reflexivity. So on the one hand, as was brought up earlier this morning, you could see reflexivity as a term that is um, to do with being self-reflective. And as you were saying earlier, it could be narcissistic or there are other ways of thinking about it that have come up today, which is to kind of take a second look at or to be self-critical of the situation that you're in or the institution, how it's developing. So that's one way of looking at it. And the other way of thinking about it that takes it slightly further is through this idea of reflexive modernity, which is basically trying to um, establish that modernity is not over. Let's forget this kind of post-modernity aspect for a while and that there is a second phase or a kind of late modernity that is happening, that um, its trait, the most recognizable trait is that it's reflexive. And by that, um, the thinking is that in the first wave, if you like, of modernity, um, the institutions that were established, education, welfare, political systems, um, have started to crumble and fail because of economic and cultural globalization. And as a consequence of that, there's um, another wave of the way in which modernity is happening. So they talk about it being the modernization of modernization. Or there's a way in which um, people basically becoming ambivalent to the way that the structures that have been set up for the people on behalf of um, society or civic um, society, as they're starting to fail, um, there's another way of looking at or thinking through what um, expert systems are or who is going to take charge of these. So that's a kind of terrible load of generalizations about both modernity and reflexive modernization, but it gives you a basic idea. And the reason why I put it in relation to this image as the first slide is because I took this photograph from um, one of the windows in the Tretiakov Museum um, last year or the year before, and uh, it gives you a good, it's, um, it's a way that I want to try and kind of sum up what the term institution might mean in Russia, um, even today, to kind of think about this other institutionality or a reflexive institution in relation to this. So what you see on the right is the, um, what used to be, it's now lost its status, but it used to be the tallest public sculpture in the world. I think it's now been overtaken. It's 100 meters high. It was built in 1996. And yeah, it's your right. Um, by an artist called Zurab Zeratelli, who is also, um, he's in his 80s. He is still the um, person in charge of the academy, the art academy. He's the founder of the Museum of Modern Art in Moscow. And um, it basically was um, first made as a gift for the United States. It was going to be of Columbus. Um, but when he tried to give it to the United States, it was supposed to be in New York Harbor. Um, New York said, thanks, but no thanks. And so he removed the head. Well, it wasn't made at that stage, but basically he just like, changed the head. So it's now Peter the Great. And he was very good friends. Um, Zorab Zaratelli is still an important figure in Moscow, but he um, was basically one of the apparatchiks and very high up in the artist's union. Um, so... The mayor of um, Moscow at the time in 96, which is when the kind of next lot of elections was happening to get Yeltsin back in, um, he agreed to have this sculpture put into the Moscow River as um, basically as a kind of signal towards the 300th anniversary of the Russian Navy. 
Um, and the fact that Peter the Great moved um, the capital from Moscow to St. Petersburg and hated Moscow didn't seem to matter. Anyway, within one year, there's a guy called Marek Gilman, who is known as a politician, um, also known as a gallerist, also known as a director of museums, um, started a referendum, so a year after it had been put up, to try and stop, or try and get it put back down again, or taken down. But it's made of bronze, and it was going to cost much more money than they had to get the sculpture out of the river. So um, as a way of kind of shutting Marat up, he was given a large parcel of land by the government, um, very close to Red Square. And that is where one of the earliest attempts of making a kind of cross between the Guggenheim and the Pompidou was um, under development. And it basically kept going until around about just before 2000, when the whole thing collapsed. But he was introducing a number of artists into that project. So as a way to stop him from worrying about this, they gave him a big parcel of land. On the other side, so on your left, you'll recognize it's um, the Church of Christ the Savior, which was a church that um, Tsar Nicholas basically decreed in 1812 when um, Napoleon was beaten and everybody was very happy and he had to say thank you to God for Russia still being alive. And it took 70 years, just over 70 years, to build because of the arguments as to what it should look like. So it opened in 1883. And then in under 50 years, um, the whole thing was destroyed because Stalin basically made a um, very big kind of public display of destroying it through dynamite. So it was actually a public event that you could go along to in 1931 um, to make way for the Palace of the Soviets that he wanted to build there, um, which by 1948 was also defunct because he never got any further than the foundations because of the cost of the war. And so, basically, it was just a big hole in the ground with foundations. So, when Khrushchev came in in 1958, he turned those foundations into a large public swimming pool, um, which was extremely popular. It was heated and open air, and you can go online and see great films about it. Um, so, this was a very good place for the kind of public to celebrate what was basically kind of like the end of the Soviet Union. But by 1994, that was also closed down because um, it had to make way for the church to be reinstated. So the new church opened in, um, or started, started to be built in 1995. And the inside of it is done by Zorab Zeratelli, um, who is the artist who made the ship on the other side of the... Um, and it's basically, in 2012, that's where Pussy Riot did their um, protest that got them imprisoned. So what you've got, if you want to start thinking about institutions or what an institution is on a larger scale, but that also kind of wraps art into it and the way that artists get involved is um, a scenario whereby the kind of the balance of power between religion and state and what goes back and forth and how art kind of fits between that is, you know, as you can see, complicated and still continues to this day to be complicated. And in the 1990s, when you recognize that these two um, structures, let's call them, were built at the same time that the art world was exploding with performances by um, Kulig, by Brenner. It's like 1996 was the year of, of Interpol, and all these kind of questions around Russian contemporary art. So it's in this context that Garage, like 10 years on, was um, developed, and it itself has these kind of layers of um, complexity. Um, for a number of reasons. One, um, because of the fact that it's a private institution that was started that has no kind of, no reason to really exist in um, Russia at all. It's the idea that somebody basically came up with the idea that we need a contemporary institution to do X, Y, Z. So what happened from 2008 up to now is, if you like, on one level, a kind of process of self-reflexivity. Because the institution, well, the, the organization, which was called Garage Center for Contemporary Culture um, and was named as a platform for new thinking when it first opened, shifted from, it kind of embedded itself into the community, but very much through um, a kind of way of working with architecture and existing structures and existing histories that happened there. But the programming was very much bringing things in from the outside. And when I started in 2013, um, we were kind of in the middle of the stage, that the Shigeru ban, <coughs> sorry. The building that was designed by Shigeru ban, which was a temporary pavilion in Gorky Park. 
And one of the f first things that I did was to um, hold a retreat with all the staff, including security guards and cleaners mm. and everybody. There was around 50 of us at the time in total. And what I was suggesting was that part of the issue with the institution was that although there was a kind of interest and a desire for the people working in there to develop the institution in certain ways and what in, that were important to them for thinking about their community, because of the fact that it was a platform, it was almost a project rather than it was an institution, we needed to think about it becoming an institution. We needed to put some roots down, to which I got nearly screamed out the room because of the fact that the concept of institution or institutal is um, impossible for younger people to imagine wanting to create. Why would you want to set up an institution when the histories of the institutions that you're used to looking at have got you know, so many myriad ways of going wrong and the power structure being kind of out of joint? And so basically that's a long way of trying to explain that the development of the institution that is now Garage Museum of Contemporary Art is, um, before it even can become reflexive, it's kind of understanding what, what can an institution be in this, like, the, the kind of the second wave of modernity, if you like, when it's created in a situation with private money in a country that um, has so many issues, you know, in relation to culture and in relation to the way that the politics and culture are working together, what does it actually look like? So, um, the way that I think of um, Garage is that it's a publicly minded, privately funded institution. And this whole idea of kind of creating something that um, had permanence is around the idea of trying to take the institution outside of the, the self-reflexivity or the self-reflection that can go on and take it into a kind of a much broader way of getting um, a public to feel like it is their place and it is somewhere that is going to exist long enough. When I first started at Garage, even talking to the likes of, um, you know, some of the main curators like Bakshin or Missiano, they would not, if I suggested to them that they could, we could develop an exhibition together for 2017, they would laugh me out the room because in 2013 or 14, there was no way that Garage was going to have survived. And um, it's not because of me that it has survived, it's just that there is a different system that is evolving that I think is interesting to look at. So in 2014, when we um, renamed the um, place museum, rather, so Garage Museum of Contemporary Art rather than Garage Center for Contemporary Culture, it was for a number of reasons. The first of which is that the word museum, at least when you're talking about an institution, is one that is um, basically trying to um, be something that can be understood by a much broader public than um, a center, because a center is more of a, in, in kind of Russian thinking and terminology, a center is more like a club. So um, in trying to kind of shift into something that was, had a kind of stronger institutional structure, um, the word museum made most sense. And then it was a question of how, how do you start to discuss what a contemporary museum is and what contemporaneity can mean to the museum. So that's when the word reflexivity started to come in. And the whole thing was kind of launched with a conference finding, our, like, understanding ideas from other, other people and places. And it was also trying to understand it in relation to a whole load of different um, institutional models that have been developing since the mid-2000s, mostly, um, which are all coming out of um, kind of non-state um, funding sources. So SALT, which was Platform Garantia, is one of the earliest examples, along with the Mori Art Museum. Um, they're at different scales, different levels. This is, um, they're not kind of homogenous. They don't operate in the same way. Some of them are already collapsing or collapsed in terms of the way that structures are working. Others aren't. But there's this, this kind of other way, this kind of private, privately funded wave that has been developing over the last decade or so. And it's also kind of thinking about an institution that sits between these two um, kind of modes as well, because when contemporary art is not something that is particularly um, known or people aren't really interested in it, it's like the whole idea of kind of blowing up the museum. It says, so my proposal, this is the artist speaking, so my proposal is this, I tried to bomb the museum, you try to stop me, I go down in art history as the visionary artist and you as the retrograde curators. And then on the other side you have the kind of rise of the Guggenheim like um, spectacle culture. So these are the kind of parameters through which you know, I'm, I'm starting to understand how the museum operates. And one of the key factors is that 
it's basically run by people that the average age is 28, and they are the post-Soviet generation, and they are creating something. I'm very much the kind of old person there, and I'm the only person that doesn't speak Russian. Everybody else is Russian, apart from one Bulgarian who speaks Russian. Um, and the fact that the collection is actually based on, like, in terms of the way that we can call ourselves museum, it's an archive. So the archive is basically telling the history of Russian contemporary art um, from the materials that um, give it evidence, if you like, because otherwise the, the objects have either left the country or they've been destroyed. And so this is kind of another way which we can start to um, speak about what's actually been going on um, over time in Russia, like, over time. All right, I'm going to skip a couple of these. Um, this is something which I'm kind of putting out there because I'm, I'm interested to hear. That in, in the same way that um, public institutions um, in the West have always thought that it's very important to kind of support the infrastructure around the way that a museum is developing. It's like you can't just create it in a bubble. Um, it's something that um, a lot of the people who are kind of involved in making Garage happen, the, kind of the staff there, the young staff, they also want to support the infrastructure that is happening around. So there are a number of grant programs that have been developed by Garage. Um, it doesn't work in exactly the same way as it does when there's an infrastructure around there when other people can give grants or are giving grants. But it's, it is a way of supporting artists and writers and the kind of development. And then the one, two last things. Um, also kind of thinking through who is the audience, how, how does it work in terms of um, creating different ways of looking at what an institution can be. We've been developing a lot of work with people with disabilities, and, but in order to even do that, we're having to invent language with the, um, kind of the people who are the experts in the country because there are no words in Russian sign language, for example, that you can describe anything to do with art. So in order to do that, there's an awful lot of systems that have to be kind of set up before you can do anything um, like around it. So I'm just going to end on because I've got one minute left. Um, this is the most recent, so basically we're working with the archive, we're doing a lot of research, but the most recent project is the Triennial of Russian Contemporary Art, which is another way of trying to understand how to connect, if you like, this kind of, this, this local interest and this, um, the idea of there being um, art that nobody's able to see, either from Russia or from outside of Russia. Nobody really knows what's going on with Russian contemporary art. Um, and also connecting it to an international interest, the fact that people are kind of wary of what's happening in Russia, but are aware of the fact that they haven't actually seen anything that's going on there. And so um, this is coming out of extensive research across the country um, by curators that speak Russian and can kind of communicate directly. And like traveling to as many places, there's 42 different places across the country that they've gone to to find out what's going on, find out which artists are practicing, um, what they're doing, and then basically make an exhibition out of that that will be repeated every three years. The reason why there's a big gap in that map is not because they didn't want to go there, it's because that's like the tundra and a lot of ice and not, right? So when we do the, the, bi or the triennial of animal art, we can go to that part. I'm just gonna... So <clears throat> I'll end there because that says zero. I, I can't see because I'm blind, but <laughs> that says one. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, basically it's just, I'm, I'm just kind of putting out there that the, the notion of thinking, thinking of Gouage as a reflexive institution insofar as thinking of the second understanding of what refle reflexive modernity might be or how modernity is being kind of rethought. And it is through the notion of reflex rather than being reflective. So there's an awful lot of stuff that's happening in the way that Garage is developing because I'm the only person that comes from outside um, and I'm clearly not the person that's kind of making all of this happen. I put my knowledge and interest and expertise alongside people who are coming from very, very different backgrounds, who are young, who don't really give a damn about the way that institutions develop in the West or elsewhere, but who are hell-bent on making something that's really important to them in Russia you end up with this very different way of looking to how like, an institute, a contemporary art institution might actually be able to function in the future. I mean, it's definitely to be continued. The end. <laughs>